Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of the Vitality Coaches Wellbeing Programme. My name is Jamie, and I'm part of the coaching team at Vitality, where my role is head of health engagement. And our theme for September is all about maximising potential. Now, our guest today is someone that I've been really privileged to work with quite a few times. And at Vitality, she's one of our performance champions and genuinely one of the most interesting and inspirational people I've ever worked with. Now, our topic today is all about relentlessness. And I think that any goal which is worthwhile will probably require some element of motivation, determination and being relentless. Now, Emma Wiggs, MBE, I must remember that always, is a double Paralympic gold medalist. She is a 10 times world champion. She's an eight time European champion, winning two European gold medals this year alone. So her resume is incredible. Her story is amazing. But actually what I'm really interested to do through this conversation is bring out more about what motivates Emma, what keeps her coming back and driving for more because she's not only achieved everything in the sport once, She's achieved it multiple times and is continuing to progress and pursue even more. And I think that um, everyone watching, please just come in with an open mind. And there's so many lessons along the way. Obviously, Emma's career is sport focused, but actually the way that she speaks translates into every single part of life. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this one. So Emma, thank you so much for joining us again. How are you doing? I'm good, Jamie, although a bit disappointed that you forgot that I've also got my brownie teas made badge. <laughs> um as wow. well as those as well as those other bits and bobs so um, is if that maybe it, at the top of the tree or i mean i think it's, it's it's pretty high up there because i am a lover of tea so um great no, yeah it's it's great to be here and i'm looking forward to chatting amazing well thank you for your time and emma is fresh off of an incredible summer yet again every summer i think seems to be like that for you but emma before we kind of go into the topic of relentlessness and and the, your drive and things like that I think it's important for context that people understand your journey a little bit, because what I've just done there is read out your achievements, but actually they're an end product of everything you've been through and all the work that you've put in. So would you mind just sharing with us a little bit about your story and kind of what's led you to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think I love the fact that you pointed out that I am a canoeist and, and my journey and my examples are based in canoeing but actually it is so much more more than that and um I was actually able-bodied until the age of 18 went on a gap year to Australia you know had it all planned out for this amazing year unfortunately six weeks in contracted a virus and was paralyzed in my arms and my legs overnight so my life changed quite dramatically in a, in a moment and although my arms recovered my legs didn't so from that moment on I became a, a full-time wheelchair user and uh, clearly had to go in a slightly different direction to what I'd planned. And I guess that's probably where the relentlessness started. Um, and then, you know, without wanting to go on to a whole history, I, I basically ended up uh, going to university eventually. And then I found Paralympic sport and I went to the London 2012 Paralympic Games as a sitting volleyball player. Um, and then after those games, which was just an incredible experience, I switched sports to canoeing. And that's where I really found um, both my love of, of sport and physical activity, but also my successes and, and some of the things I've been able to achieve way, way beyond anything that I would have dreamt was possible as an able, able-bodied person or as a person with a disability. So, yeah, and I've ended up here still canoeing, um, you know, nearly 10 years on and uh, loving every minute of it and still managing to make the boats faster. I think that's it. The, the key thing for me there about our topic today is that you're still pushing, you're still making the boats faster. I mean, for me, one Paralympic Games or any sort of achievement like you've had, people might just rest on those things. And I think, Emma, we, we're obviously, I, I mentioned a few words there about what relentlessness is for me, potentially about like grit, determination, hard work, consistency. But interested to know, like, how would you define what relentlessness means to you? I think it's a really interesting one, Jamie. I think actually for me, it's probably one of my greatest traits, um, but maybe also one of my most challenging <laughs> features. Um, yeah. And I think there's, there's there's good aspects and bad aspects to uh, relentlessness. But I think for for myself, I've managed to use that that drive. I guess I think you mentioned drive as well. That drive and that that desire to want to to be better and to to take an opportunity. Um, I've managed to use that to to kind of get where I am today and, and get where I am in, in my recovery, but also in my sport. 
Um, and I think that can sometimes be quite hard to, to live with. Um, but also probably my greatest weapon in in still being able to do what I'm doing at the age of 42. Don't tell anyone that, that I am 42. Um, still in your prime. And I, <laughs> and I think it is, it's just that it's that desire to want to try my best and to do the best with the bits of me that work. And I think I've learned as I've got a bit older that 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 doesn't guarantee you outcomes. Yeah. But that relentless drive doesn't change for me, right. regardless of the outcomes. It does it doesn't change depending on, on a, whether I win or whether I don't win. That that yeah, drive is still there. And the one thing I really feel passionate about is that that relentless drive means that I'm in the best place and the best position to deliver the best I've got. And on the day, yeah. sometimes that's a medal and sometimes it's not. But um that that's given me the best chance of of doing something incredible. I think the interesting thing you said there is is about that the, your relentlessness isn't dependent upon the outcome. So for you, do you ever think about, or is it something that you're aware of about the source of this drive, like whether it's internal or external, or if there's things within you, or if it's experiences that have made you yeah. think this way? I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because I kind of think that my upbringing, my family, my genes have got to be a real part of of me. Um, and I've, you know, I had, I've got a twin brother and an older sister. We were always physically active and competitive as as children growing up. I've got incredible parents, and I feel like, you know, they they instill those characteristics in you. Um, but I do think, actually, you know, if I reflect on becoming disabled, I think something that that can impact your life um, does change you. It does it does shape how you move forward. Um, and that doesn't have to be something quite as dramatic as what happened to me. It can be any sort of change, any sort of challenge that people face. And, and in those moments, you've got a choice about how you're going to respond. And I think for me, some of my relentlessness comes out of those situations. Uh, a bit like a phoenix from the flames. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I associate you with. I think there's a really interesting point there, Emma, because one of the things in the pre-registered questions we, we've got before this session was about is being relentlessness a positive? Because sometimes it can come from places which are maybe, you know, experiences that have happened in the past which fuel you. And so what you've just said there, your experience is obviously really, really unique. Um, and would you say that, that your that experience and that drive that it's given you has been based off of positive th feelings around what's happened or negative. And by negative, maybe I'm thinking about things like people doubting you or maybe yeah. you thinking that you are held back in any way. Like are those, what, what sort of drive is it from that place? Yeah, I think, I think it might be a bit of a mixture of both. I think certainly when you've, when you've got a disability or you face any sort of discrimination or people judging you, I think there is that, um, that chance that you will then want to prove them wrong. Um, I think I was always driven as a child. So pre-disability, I was always quite driven um, and wanting to, to do things well. But I think that I think you're right. I think that has changed in the face of adversity to be wanting to prove not necessarily always to other people, but to myself that yeah. I am still uh, a whole human, still a complete package, yeah. even though kind of only two thirds of me works. And I think, yeah, so it probably does come from a from a negative original original place as well as as well as the positives that I try to turn it into but I think all it means is I have to be slightly careful of moments where that relentlessness can be unhelpful yeah um, and I yeah. think that's also been a bit of a journey of yeah. uh, of ups and downs um for me anyway about how about how I understand myself and how I get the best out of myself um, and it isn't always to be absolutely relentlessly relentless yeah, I mean, we should count how many times that. we say relentless. We? <laughs> I think you we're doing pretty well so far. I think that's something that we're going to come back to later, is especially about like how you work with others about with when you've got such big goals and ambitions. But one thing, Emma, that um, just to cover this kind of final point is that I often look at some of the, the world's greatest achievers in the in the sporting realm. You're up there, but recently you'll have seen maybe that Serena Williams is yeah. kind of coming to the end of her career and someone like Lewis Hamilton or Roger Federer or, you know, Alison Phoenix in athletics. There's so many incredible stories of these incredible athletes that are still pushing and pursuing greatness well beyond 
achieving because you know and, and that always is something that kind of makes me question people's intention when you look at sports people and they talk about money all the time someone any of those names that we've just listed they've they haven't needed money for years and years and years like they've earned yeah. their fortunes they're doing fine but they still have that consistent and relentless drive but often if you hear the stories about these people they're fueled by adversity or failure and all those sorts of things so long-winded but my question to you is do you think that adversity is necessary in order to have that drive or do you think it's something because you mentioned you, you probably have an element of both but do you think it's something which is present within the highest achievers? I think I think it is. I think there is there is an element of of that fear of of uh, failing or that fear of um, not being good enough that that drives you that extra that extra mile. Um, and I think it possibly is 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 there in in the top sports people because otherwise, why would you get out of bed on a dark cold November morning and go and yeah. put yourself on a lake to train in horrendous conditions there has to be something that little bit extra that's driving you mm -hmm. and that can be present in someone that's not sporty as well you know it's yeah. just that little extra bit that means that you're going to go that half a step further um yeah. then then you might do without without that and I think I'm very fortunate that my job is sport and I'm very passionate about that and that's that's why I get out of bed in the morning it's it, it's harder when you're trying to juggle lots of different things that you're trying to to achieve so a job a family a, some sort of personal sporting you know desire or goal and I think it's a, it's that really hard juggling act whereas mine is quite laser focused on this is my job and this is why I'm going to get out of bed in the morning but I think yeah I think that 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 slightly negative fear of of not taking that opportunity not necessarily of failure because I think you make a really good point with Serena Williams you know she's an undisputable champion like the greatest there's ever been in tennis men and women and she's you know she's just I think retired six ranked 600 and something in the world yeah. now to anyone else 600 and something in the world would seem a failure so it's how you define your success yeah. that will influence that relentless drive and how you're going to how you're going to achieve it because it isn't just about outcomes and and numbers on the world rankings or medals in the bag yeah I think that's a key point as well is that like for anyone watching it doesn't need to be in a sporting context necessarily it also probably doesn't need to be the biggest failure or the biggest piece of adversity like everyone yeah. has their own things that maybe I don't want to say trigger them but like inspire them even and I think like that's kind of what you're saying there Emma is about it probably does need to be more internal than external but that can be whatever it looks like for you so are you able to share with us maybe an example of something that could have been deemed as failure but how you responded to that and how that's actually helped you going forward in your career as well yeah I think you know I've been I've been really fortunate that I've since I've since I've gone into canoeing, been able to work hard, complete the training, and and, and achieve some results. But there are ups and downs along that journey. You know, one hundred percent. There's injuries, or there's things outside of of sport that are really really challenging that add to the kind of mix and and, and make things a bit a bit harder. I think for me, I've had um, you know a, a significant wrist injury that not only impacted my 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 canoeing, but my life as a wheelchair user. You know, you can't do much with one with one working limb while this one's getting fixed. So that I think was a really, really big turning point for me where my life kind of derailed a bit because I had really based all of my self esteem and, and me as a person on my canoeing results. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was what I was relentlessly driving towards. And as soon as that's under threat or taken away, then what do you become? And I think that was a real wake up call for me to realize that that possibly that relentless drive was just slightly misdirectioned. And I, yeah. what I needed to be doing was was putting that same energy and that same focus into everything that I am. So being relentless about, you know, having a balance. So having a life as well as being a, an athlete or having some rest days as well as training really, really hard, making sure I see family 
you know, those sorts of things, making sure I'm more than just one thing. It didn't have to just be relentlessly in one direction, in one aspect of my life. That's that's where we end up in a in a slippery slope. And that's where maybe people listening will recognise if, if you put all of your energy and drive into your job, there's not much left for the other aspects. Yeah. And, and that can be a really challenging place. So I think that was a really big learning point for me in that adversity of that injury it was it was you know relatively minor in the great scheme of things let's be honest a little wrist injury but it was a real wake-up call to realize that you know that there has to be some some choices and some changes to where I'm directing those those traits that are part of me yeah I think that's um again an example whereby we should translate that to to everyday people with various different demands and things like you said like there's family life there's work life but no one of those things defines you so in I think it's great that we can talk about this in hindsight I'm sure it's a very different feel when you were going through it how were you able to remind yourself that this doesn't define me but also I want to get back to it because is it quite hard to be able to because as soon as I start to stray my attention towards a variety of things I feel like well what am I then so how did you cope with having balance but still being driven and wanting to be passionate about pursuing your sporting career I think I think the main thing for me was changing that that definition of success so I think probably the biggest turning point for me was realizing that unless I take the time to define success for me it's easy to think success is something that it isn't so you know people assume and I think I assumed before I became an athlete that athletes were only there about gold medals yeah. But, you know, when you look at a, an Olympic Games or a Paralympic Games, there's only one gold medal. You know, in each event, there's only one gold medal. So to define your success based on that would be a bit unhelpful. So yeah. I think probably the biggest learning for me was actually to look at what success was. And this is where hopefully people listening can can take this as an example. Um, you know, it lots of people will, will aim towards a goal, but they won't actually define what that success is. So for for me, being able to say, right, well, success for me today is going to be survival because it's a bad day. I've woken up, not feeling great. Success is survival to get around to bedtime or whatever it might be. Or or some days it will be success will be helping someone else. I've got extra energy today. I'm going to help somebody else with what they're doing. That's where my drive and my focus is going to be alongside the other things that I'm going to achieve. And unless we take the time to actually do that, we're not only wasting some energy, but we're missing an opportunity to to feel that success do you know what I mean to to get yeah. that buzz from yeah. from completing something and also it takes away that um the damaging part of being relentless that we talked about at the start of yeah. always wanting to lift more weights get paddle a boat faster eat better food that's quite exhausting do you know what yeah. I mean and no one can yeah. do that all the time and in in other people's lives it might be I'm always going to be the best parent or I'm always going to be the best colleague or the yeah. best husband or the best wife, whatever it might be, that's just not, that's not achievable all of the time. Yeah. yeah. So by by being really clear about what it looks like for us, given how we're feeling, what we've got going on, the plates that we've got spinning, being yeah. clear about what that success looks like, will will have an absolutely instant positive impact on how we're feeling, most importantly, but also how we're going to perform and how successful we're going to be. I love it when you talk about that, because I think it's, goes way beyond just a performance element where essentially what you're saying Emma is like you need to fresh start every single day you need to check in with yourself and see what's my form on this day and once you've figured that out you can understand what good performance looks like for you so some days I say it's just survival another day it might be I'll thrive but I'll also help someone else thrive but you can't do that every single day what interests me is this um specifically relentlessness and a sporting context I know how hard you push but also are pushed and something that we always obviously want to encourage people is to be able to look after themselves and at times that means being kind to yourself as well from a sporting perspective how is that managed so on the days where you think I'm not a 10 survival yeah. is key but someone's pushing you even more and more and there's pressure yeah. how do you work with them to allow you to maybe readjust at all? Is that flexibility yeah. there? I, yeah, I think it is. Even at, even at the elite level, I think it is. And I think it's something that coaches are learning more and more about. Um, and again, it comes down to kind of saying, OK, well, do you know what? Today I'm a seven out of ten. 
So what does this session look like if I'm only a seven out of 10? And it's being okay with that. So it's about cutting yourself some slack and not, you know, what I used to do, Jamie, was always expect myself to be up here because, you know, I've acquired a disability. I want to prove to everybody that I'm, you know, still that that whole human and all the rest of it. And there's all that science kind of negative aspects of that relentless drive, meaning that I'm setting myself up here, expecting myself from here. I wouldn't expect some of those things from other people. So why would I expect them of, of myself? So it's it's being aware of that, so that internal dialogue, but it's also being able to communicate that with your coaches or your teammates and saying, mm. you know, so every morning we do like a wellness score and our okay. coaches can look at that on a computer screen to see, oh, well, Em's like, she slept quite well. She's a nine out of 10 for energy. You know, she's going to be great today. It might be that I'm, I might have slept all right and I'm feeling I've got energy, but I might have other stuff going on that, that takes some of that brain capacity. And yeah. that will require a conversation with someone to say, do you know what, actually today I'm going to be happy with this and this rather than yeah. aiming up here. So it's that ability to communicate. But in order yeah. to do that, you've got to understand yourself first, what right. you've got, what you've got to give. And if people don't want to do it every single day, then start by doing it once a week. Start yeah. by saying, right, on a Sunday night, how am I feeling about this week? What have I got to give? What have I got going on? And what would good look like? What would what would good look like this week? And start with that as an overview and see how you go. And then, you know, you, then you can bring it down to every day if you find it helpful. Do you have a process of how you check in on yourself to understand how you're doing it? Is it daily? Is it yeah. weekly? Like, is there a, something that you do? Kind of yeah I do I do it I'm gonna I'm gonna sound very 1990s uh now but I do I actually do it on a piece of a piece of wallpaper every okay. single sun every every Sunday night I've got one of those rolls of um I think it's lining paper but it's effectively okay. wallpaper. Nice. and I, I literally just write down on a Sunday night um what what success would look like for that week anything else I've got going on um and I can't I sometimes will be more specific about you know my types of sessions so it might be water sessions or gym sessions or whatever it might be um but I give myself a kind of a thing of a list of what success would look like and sometimes that can be training stuff and sometimes it will be you know I'm going to clean the bathrooms before Wednesday or you know like it can be yeah. it can be whatever you want but it just gives you that little bit of structure sure. um to then be able to look back and and see what you've achieved I think that's amazing I think it's one of those things that you say you know I mean, writing it down on paper is already baffles me. I think I'm glad. That I know, and, and, but that's not. To... Yeah, but you see, but that, and, and also that's not for everyone. So people won't be like turning off right now, thinking, yeah. "I'm not right. I've got, yeah. I've got time to write stuff down." It doesn't yeah. even have to be written down. It's, you know, some some people I talk to, you know, I explain that in the morning when I'm brushing my teeth, I'll look in the mirror and decide, like, okay, like, what have I got today? Like, because yeah. I can see myself. I can see right. Okay, you're looking, you're looking all right, or you're not looking great. <laughs> What yeah. have I got to give today? What have I got coming up that might trip me up? And I find yeah. that just taking that minute, that it's literally one or two minutes, it means I'm better prepared for what might come in the day. And I found that I've then dealt better with those situations than I would have done in the past without that little step. Right. No, I think that's brilliant. And, and something I'll always remember is someone once said that between um, – action and reaction there's a space and yeah. that's almost what you're doing yourself and again like let's translate this into a work environment if you've got a meeting and you're turning up a little bit anxious or stressed or you've got a lot on knowing that when someone says something instead of triggering and maybe coming in and regretting something yeah. you've already said well my approach to this meeting needs to be I need to take some time before I react and yeah like, just having that check in is huge right it, it can affect the way that you talk to people for the whole day just by taking yeah, that one and moment. I think it for me anyway it's about putting in that moment of accountability so yeah. I, I I will I can't forget that I've had that that internal conversation with myself if if I've done it in the morning I can't then forget that for the rest of the day so that yeah. when those situations arise I've already got that accountability to go back to and that again if we're talking about relentlessness that that can be a part of my relentless process to my day yeah. and to how I'm going to behave, how I'm going to respond in that day is part of that, of that process. 
Yeah, I think that's that's a really, really important point is that, again, what we're looking at with relentlessness and going back to those pre-registered questions, it isn't about always smashing it and always being no. the one driving people forward. So how, Emma, your sport is individual, but it's also very team related in about how you train and working with coaches and various different psychologists or nutritionists. Like You've got a whole support team around it. How do you know when to adjust and adapt your approach? Because I know you, you are one of the most determined people I've ever met. And we were discussing before we filmed this. For anyone that doesn't know, this summer, Emmy achieved a half a second PB, which is huge. And that doesn't come without smashing it a lot of the time. Yeah. So how do you know when that you might need to adapt and adjust your approach? Because no one wants to be relentless and hate, everyone hates them along the way of part of it, right? Like you've I know. got to bring and people I'm, on the journey. I was literally going to say that, Jamie, because I think... <laughs> You know, as you as you get older, as you as you go through more of life and you more of these experiences, you kind of get those moments where you reflect back and realize like, wow, like I was quite hard work to be around yeah. <laughs> to be around at that time. Or I can see why some of my teammates roll their eyes when I'm asking another question in a meeting or, yeah. uh, you know, challenging why people might be late for a session or whatever it might be. And that's the relentless part of of me that I need to be a bit more aware of and a bit more in control of to get the best out of other people mm -hmm. because without other people I would be nothing yeah so I need to make sure that I'm getting the best out of other people in order to to give me the opportunity to to be the best that I can be so I think I have to I have to have learned and I and I am still learning about moderating that um relentless drive because the the standards that I apply to myself, which are probably deep rooted psychologically in, in someone who's become disabled, but they are much higher than I would ever put on anybody else. Yeah. And what I need to learn is that what I expect of myself isn't necessarily what I should expect of other people. And that, that yeah. doesn't mean that, that, that I'm better than anyone else. Absolutely the opposite. It just means that I'm going to be a nicer to be around and be probably actually better in myself if I've not created a an environment that is critical or challenging and sometimes yeah. that can just be in the words that we use so my okay. coach is an absolute legend he's, he's just brilliant but we could at times be in conflict because I would be saying we should be doing this why aren't I faster why am I no good you know we should be doing that da, 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 da. and that was coming across to him as quite critical in a way that right. I wasn't meaning, I wasn't meaning that he was, his plan was rubbish or his coaching was rubbish. I was yeah. meaning, why am I not better? Why am I not good enough? But it was coming across as, as critical of him. Whereas by changing the word should to could, it yeah. completely changes that conversation. Sure. And it actually then helps both of us. So it allows me to be relent relentless in my quest to be better. So yeah. I changed should to could. So could we could we have done this better? Could we try this? Could I be better if I did this? Is yeah. a complete, it even sounds different, Jamie, doesn't it? You can't yeah, say yeah. could, you can't say could in an aggressive, critical way. You just yeah, can't. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's hearing it differently going, oh, okay. So she's interested in whether we could do something differently or whether we could learn from what's happened or whatever it might be. Yeah. And it was small changes like that, that kind of ticked both boxes, ticked my box for being relentless, at myself and self-critical and, and wanting to strive and it also ticked his box because he wants us to to grow and develop and and pursue making the boats go faster so again it's a bit of a um hopefully that's applicable to, to people's lives as well yeah no I think it's amazing and it goes back to your point which is so true about defining what success is and and for me if you're Emma you're achieving all these incredible things that isn't what success looks like for you because 99 percent of your time is actually not spent in those races it's spent in the day-to-day -day working with these people and it's a shame no one sees that we were talking again before and everyone sees you with your medals and you're doing the post-race interviews people don't see you in a cold november morning at 6 a.m hating life and not wanting to get the boat you know like so success isn't about that end result at all for you is it no, not for me. And I don't think it is, you know, it, it is it is going to be for some athletes, but I don't think it is for the majority. And, and probably my best example would be in the race two weeks ago when I got that PB, I could have finished last. Yeah. 
and that PB would have been an unbelievable outcome. But on the day, that was worth ninth, for example. Now, it, yeah. it didn't, it turns out on the day that was first. Yeah. But it was that, it's the, it's the it's the process and the time that is my my strive and my goal rather yeah. than the shiny the shiny medal and that might seem a bit odd because i guess one goes with the other potentially but i've got yeah. no control over what anyone else is doing so for me to deliver at that time if if when i'd crossed the line i'd seen i was last i might have had that initial oh no like have i have i come last yeah. Because I wouldn't have known the time. But then when you see the time, I'd have been like, well, that's a PB. That is the best I could have done. Mm -hmm. And do you know what? On the day, there were eight people faster. Yeah. So I couldn't have done any more. So yeah. without that that clear idea of what success is, that success is completely controllable by me. Yeah. You know, if, if it's a if it's a, a time, I can I can impact that with my recovery, with my choices, with my training, with the help that I get from other people, with my communications with other people. Lots and lots of things impact that. I cannot really impact the, the colour of a medal based on a, a set of performances. I think what we're doing here is maybe defining how to be relentless in the right way. And um, yeah. I we did an interview earlier this year and um, it was with, I was saying to you as well about this interview was with one of the coaches who coaches the US Olympic team. This is a different example though. And he was saying that, so when we were talking about like adjusting and adapting and working with others, he said, he gave an example of two athletes driving in the car in room. Um, they're on the motorway and the driver had been driving for a couple of hours, looked to his fellow athlete in the passenger seat and said, um, do you fancy stopping for a coffee? And so the person in the passenger seat said, no, I'm all right, thanks. And then they drove on. But two people after that situation were annoyed because what I would interpret the driver asking whether you want to stop for a coffee at is they want to stop for a coffee. But yeah. the person in the passenger seat just took it as a straightforward question and was like, oh, he's asking for a coffee, but I'm OK. So I'll say no. And they're completely both right. But yet yeah. they ended up having some tension between them because they're very different styles and very different personalities yeah. so how do you understand yourself and your team better and again like that could be family it could be workplace or it could be a sporting environment like are there anything yeah. that you do to appreciate who each of you are but then most importantly what each of you needs as well yeah and, and again Jamie this is a piece of work that we did as a as a team um that was hugely impactful and we did it in the run-up to the games the the Tokyo Paralympic Games last year but it's something that I always encourage whenever I talk to anyone in business or in their personal lives you've got to make people aware of what you look like on a good day mm -hmm. and what you look like on a bad day and what more most importantly what you need on a bad day to help yeah. you have a better day yeah and and it's such an important piece of work I think quite a lot of us well in fact, in fact I think all of us all of us know what we're like on a bad day don't we? We all we all know what our kind of bad day M might look like. And we also probably know what our good day M might look like. But I don't think many of us tell people what right. we need to help us come out of that bad day. And that'll be different for everybody. So some of my teammates, they would they would present like, OK, so on a bad day, I'm going to be quiet or I might be moody or I might be short with people. And I don't want anyone to talk to me. I just want to be left alone. Other people will be like, so I might be quiet, I might be moody, I might be short with people, but I want you to come and talk to me. I want you to take me for a coffee. I want yeah. you to come and put your arm around me or whatever it might be. So two people can have exactly the same presentation but need something completely different. So yeah. we're really missing a trick if we're not communicating with people. And I think maybe in business, maybe there's a fear more than in sport of telling people our weaknesses. I don't know. I mean, I, you, you probably know more about business and life than than me I think we, we live in quite a, a, a bizarre world as an athlete but I think we're quite reluctant to, to to show our weaknesses and to show people what we need to help and I think for me it's been one of the biggest game changers you know after that wrist injury when I was really struggling I literally sat down and said to to my group of of my closest family and coaches and helpers 
this is what I need you to do. I need you to help me with this because I can't, I can't manage this. I can't do it on my own. And also, and then I had other conversations with my coach to say, you know, when I'm feeling like this, I need you to say this. Yeah. I don't need you to say this because unless we tell people that they're doing something that's really unhelpful, they're not going to change. Yeah. So, so the best example of that would be in my world, if the weather's bad, I used to freak out in racing and I'd be like, okay. I can't race in this. I'm, you know, I'm too disabled. I can't race in bad weather. My coach would be thinking like, right, okay, it's bad weather. Em's going to freak out. I'm going to tell her that it's the same for everyone. And it, and that's, and that's what I'm going to tell her because then that's the truth because it is the same for everyone and that'll be okay. And yeah. he would say that to me and I would be like, well, it's not the same for everyone <laughs> because <laughs> this is how I'm feeling. And yeah. all I needed him to say was, yeah, it's not great mm. conditions. Yeah. But you've paddled in it before and I believe in you. Yeah. And that's what he thought he was saying. Right. Until I sat down and said, this is really unhelpful. This is what I need you to say. He had no idea. And yeah. it was a it was that's a really silly example, but it's a really great example of how that honest conversation, good day, bad day, this is what I need, can transform relationships and therefore, you know, happiness and performances. So what I think is you mentioned there about like workplaces and maybe home lives being different sport. But what I love doing and working with, you'll notice that we work with lots of athletes and sports people, because I think there's so many lessons from that environment that can be taken into other people's journeys in their lives. And what I think the key thing you said there is not only are you telling people what you don't need, more importantly, you're telling them what you do need. Because I feel yeah. like everyone's like, I don't need that from you. And you're like, yeah. all right, but I'm trying to help. So can you tell me what you do need? And that's yeah. just a and really also, And thing. also that, that whole conversation was, don't do that. I don't need that. Yeah. I'm trying to help. That's yeah. such a, like a negative yeah. like setup, isn't it? Whereas if we've, and, and the, the key thing as well, Jamie, is to have these conversations before these moments. Yeah, right. So I, and like, I, I can remember like, like when we were growing up, if, say our rooms were untidy or we'd left the house in a mess or whatever and mum would go really quiet and we'd be like uh oh like it's and it's yeah. too late then so you can't, you kind of can't backtrack so you can yeah. quickly scurry around and try and tidy your stuff up but it's already had that impact whereas if you know if mum had sat down and said like you know if I've asked you to tidy your room once you know you need to do it otherwise I'm going to get really tired and cross and da 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 yeah. And we could have then kind of worked it out quicker. Yeah. And I think, I think it is just that it's just that communication piece. And I think there's there's such power in communicating. And I think that's something maybe it's my age and or maybe it's my relentless drive to want to find other things to to help me make the boat faster. That means yeah. that I'm willing to have those those quite uh, vulnerable, honest conversations. And I think I don't see that in some other athletes or younger athletes um and it'll be another step for them when they when they do and I think it's just something that in life you know my, my me and my wife have those conversations now so you know yeah, we now okay. know you know how to how to respond or it's really I really don't like it when you say that <laughs> do you yeah. know what I mean it's it's, yeah, it's, it's just having those, those it, conversations. Right? like it's yeah. not getting up there because I think the intention is really important if your intention Always. is good you can deliver it wrong is that yeah. fair to say as long as absolutely but then it's down to the other person to help you yeah. deliver it right for you yeah and also our, you know someone's intention can be completely misread by 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 the other person can't it yeah yeah so, i think that's and, and also, that's one of the things that's, you know and, and unless the, unless people communicate that it's really it then just festers yeah because you know well i thought you meant this well no no i didn't mean that oh i thought yeah. you said that yeah no i did say that but I didn't mean that. I didn't mean it that way. I meant it this way. So, and it builds up, right? It just yeah. escalates. And then before you know it, you've probably made, I remember one of my favourite kind of quotes is something like 95% of the things that you fear about happening will never happen. And and yeah. that is often the case with people. I think like text messaging or like WhatsApping is a, is a good yeah. example of it where you read something and you're like, well, they hate me. But the yeah. tone isn't there. There's you, You've got no context to it. Yeah. But you and it's so funny, isn't it, how you can... You can read it out one way and then you can read it a different way and you're like, that's yeah. that's a completely different, yeah. different story. So, you know, we, you know, we know we're not meaning to teach people to suck eggs, but communication is is crucial. And I think that 
coming back to relentless, that relentless part of me drives me to want to be better at it, mm -hmm. which means I've got to then be willing to be honest and open and vulnerable. And, and it's those things that I think sometimes people people hold back on because they just are nervous about it. Yeah, it's. I think we've really redefined relentlessness for us anyway, that it's there is that part of you and that internal, but then there's also your relentless drive to support others to understand you better so that they can help you. But Emma, at the moment, you've just, like we said, you've come off, I'm not going to stop mentioning it, ridiculous summer. You're smashing it again. But you've, you obviously have a little break now. I think you said you're back to training Monday and it starts all over again. So what I'm interested to find out at this point is you're actually on your own right now. So how, where does your motivation come back? First day of school term, I always remember it. Yeah. I hated it. Like there's no way, but when I was in it, it was fine. Do you have that or is there a feeling inside you which means I can't wait to get back. I'm going to go again and I can't wait to push for even more. Yeah, I think I think it's probably that. Like I, I, I probably on the first day of school was really excited about a new pencil case or a new yeah, school bag that. or whatever it might be. So I am excited to get back. I am. Um, and I think that's changed over the years. So I'm excited to get back to see what else we can achieve. Right. And by that, I mean, in terms of how fast we can get the boats or how strong we can get in the gym or how much better at communication I can be with with people I work with well how much of a better teammate I can be yeah rather than thinking oh gosh I've got I've got to win I've got to win the same next year like what what if I don't win the same medals next year like that yeah. doesn't that doesn't really come into my head and I think that's probably been a shift um I've never expected to line up. I never expected lining up for a race to win, but I have expected to deliver well. And, and there has been that pressure of wanting to deliver well. But actually, I've I've kind of molded that into, into what I can control, which is I will deliver the best performance I can in that moment. And yeah. that moment might be a really challenging one where I might be lining up a, as a five out of ten. Yeah. But I, I will have reevaluated that. But what I, but what I can control as of Monday next week is how I'm going to turn up to training and how I'm going to work hard for that winter block. And I think yeah. I am a bit. Um, I do love the gruesomeness of of winter. Do of winter you? Break. Do you? And I, That's yeah, and I love. I do. I love the challenge. I love the challenge of seeing what what I can do and what my body can do. And and some days and some weeks that will be. A positive and some weeks that'll be a negative and I'll be disappointed but right. there'll always be something else that we can that we can come back to to try and do and you know I just I feel like it's a it's a real privilege to always be able to be trying to learn right. and trying to be better and I think you know to to be able to sit here and and, and be fitter and stronger and more able mm -hmm. as a person with a disability than I ever was as an able-bodied person is an incredible privilege and therefore yeah. I'm excited about seeing how relentless we can be in in every aspect in my recovery and in, in making sure that I see my family more than more than I have this year you know yeah. there's, there's different ways of applying relentless when the times are tough and it's a cold dark morning it sounds to me like that's the thing that gets you up every day you, you've mentioned a few times I hope you don't mind me picking this up about how being you are a whole human and like I hope I gave this in your intro, like your medals aside, you're, a, you're an incredible human, regardless of any physical, like all of those things are so, so important. But is that something that when the times get dark and hard, you know, like when you're pushing so hard that you go a bit blind, you're like, I just, yeah. are those the things that come into your head that are deep, deep down, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, one of my values is I want to make my family proud mm -hmm. and do you know they would be proud, Jamie, if if I won no more medals for the rest of my career, cool. Cool. if I paddle my best and deliver the best the best I've got, and, yeah. and I want to make them proud. And when I actually look at um, my daily behaviours and conversations with people and actions, if those don't align to my values, then it isn't a successful day. Yeah. And actually, the one thing we've all got control of is being true to our values. So that's something that I will try to do 
even better this year is to be more consistent on those tough days at being true to my values. Because when I actually look at them, and I've written them down, you won't be surprised to hear that. I've written them down. <laughs> Good. When I look at my values and I look at the behaviours that demonstrate those values, none of those are bad. Like I yeah. can't do yeah. those if if I behave badly or yeah. not how I want to. So sure. it sets me up then as a, with a kind of blueprint of how I want to be. And, and, and also none of those are about winning. Yeah. I think that's been the key theme throughout is that actually it's about you doing the best for you. And um, yeah. you're definitely, I don't, I, I know you won't take this, but you are one of the most inspiring people I think that we've ever worked <laughs> with because of all those things. And Emma, I always try and end with one question for, for, that we can kind of compare answers with. And obviously, you know us at Vitality, like our core purpose is about enhancing people's lives. And we do that through these kind of like positive behavior change things. So this conversation isn't about your physical training or how many sets and reps you do or what you eat in a day. But I believe that it goes way deeper than that because if you've got what we're talking about here, then all of the other stuff you can apply. So the question that I kind of end on is like, is there one change, it's quite a big question, I warn you. Is there one change that you've made in your life that you feel like has had the biggest impact on you? So that could be mindset related, could be physical, could be habits. Yeah. Anything that you think that actually was a real game changer for me. God, that's a biggie to finish with. It is. I didn't give you any warning either. So no, I know. Well, I think. I mean, I think we've already talked about the bit about defining success. I think that mm -hmm. has been an absolute game changer. But I don't like repeating myself, so I'm going to bank that as a kind of okay. half my answer. It definitely one. Yeah. But as really important, but half my answer. And I think the second, the second change was was to be really clear that I want to add value when I wake up in the morning, I want to add value. That's all I want to do to myself, to other people, to whatever it is, I want to add some value. So even on those tough days, the, the added value might be to stay quiet, to, to, yeah. to not be a wrecking ball <laughs> in, in a session. That might be my added value. And on other days, it might be something different. But that was my underlying motivation, my theme, my relentless drive is I want to add value to the day, to people, to myself. I love it. Emma, we can be open now because I think it's been a success. We didn't plan this hugely because I like just talking to you and seeing what comes of this. And the perception of what I had as relentlessness at the start and looking at everyone's questions that they registered beforehand, I think we've completely changed that. Going from a definition of always pushing for more, always turning up and giving it everything and driving people around you the two things that i've just written down is how reflective you are and that you really prioritize taking time to look at things and getting perspective and also how you use that to improve your own self-awareness two things which actually require probably no physical actually stepping back and adjusting yourself and, and that's what for you has helped you be relentless do you think that's a fair yeah i think that's fair and i think you know the thing is is that I find, because it's my job, the physical relentless nature quite easy to do. Like I can tick the yeah. box and do that, I think. And maybe that's the same for other people in, in their daily lives. There are some bits of being relentless that we're quite good at. You know, people will get themselves up, get the kids up, up get them breakfast, get them to that's relentless is 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 really relentless um and what and what i did a heart are you still there i am is it okay what happened are you still there can you hear me i don't know i don't know what happened i think can you hear me yeah can you hear me? Hello. I, I can hear you. I think my battery got low and it hadn't warned uh, me. And I, think, I thought I was plugged in, but I think I turned the wrong plug on. So I've completely <laughs> messed up our whole one tape. No, 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 no. You absolutely haven't. Um, I think that we were pretty... Can I do think, that last bit again? If it was a good answer, giving you some time to think, I did throw that on you. Sorry. 
it seems to have caught up. If I just restart that final question, Sorry, then we can Jamie. just chop it. Don't be silly. It, honestly, it happens all the time. Um, then I'll just chop that bit out and we'll just carry on from there. And then that was okay. my last question. So then we'll just wrap up after that. Is that okay? okay? Sorry, mate. It's all plugged Don't in. Silly. But I, th I think silly. I put the wrong plug no. on the wall. It was, it was honestly, this has been brilliant. So what I think I just teed up the question, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. I'll just go back. We'll just act as if it's all normal. Um, Emma, one of the final questions that we always like to ask everyone um, at Vitality, obviously, kind of you'll know that our core purpose is about enhancing and protecting people's lives but the way that we do that is more about promoting positive behavior change so this session could have been about the physical things that we need to push ourselves to be doing every day or it could have been about what you eat in a day to be the best at what you do but actually I don't think any of that is relevant unless we get to the bottom of these core factors in the first place so it's a broad question which I will warn you of before but the question is What's the one change that you've made that you can identify has made a real, real difference in terms of your life? So whether that be physical, whether that be psychological, whether it be about how you approach things, anything you want. It's very big, but I'm going to just pass it your way. That is big. That is, that's a big question to finish. I think, um, you know, I've, I've talked about defining success and I don't want to re repeat myself to everybody, but I'm going to bank that as half my answer because I think okay. that's a really crucial, a crucial step. But I think the other thing is about, the decision I made to always get out of bed wanting to add value to the day, whether that be to myself or to other people or to a situation, I want to add value. And I think if we all approach our days with that in mind, then we, we're not going to do harm to other people. We're not going to have a an a unduly negative impact on, on anybody as we go about our day. And that in turn will help us, but also help other people. So, for example, whether in a session, whether it's going to be I'm going to add value by not being a wrecking ball, I'm going to be quiet, I'm going to just focus on myself and not not disrupt other people, then that is adding value in its own in its own way. But my un, my overriding desire is to add value to my day when I wake up in the morning um, and then I make a choice about what that might look like. But if that's our over, overriding value in our decision, um, it's certainly in my experience going to be a better day than it may have been in the past i love it i don't think any day can be not successful if you stick to your values and you add value and uh, you genuinely do do that bring that every single time that we talk um emma obviously congratulations on everything you've done this summer but it's always inspiring to hear from you um i'm excited to see what you're up to when we next speak but we should definitely do this more often so thanks so much for your time well, and us no thanks for having me it's lovely to chat it's a privilege for everyone watching hopefully you've enjoyed this session as well we've obviously got our theme for september around maximizing potential and i think it's a super interesting topic and we're all here to develop and grow ourselves and hopefully all these conversations are helping you so if you want to find out more please do make sure that you sign up for our events on the calendar head to our youtube channel where you've got our full content of catalog and please do share this far and wide of course it's available to vitality members but it's open to everyone and we just want to help people so i hope it does that um, but in the meantime take care emma thank you again and we'll speak soon